Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to Live with Kevin. That's me, Kevin Eikenberry. Hopefully you know that. Maybe you know that. Um, glad to have you here as we're talking about the future of work. I've got to tell you that we're calling an audible today. Uh, you may be here hoping to hear me talk with Dan Bladen, and you may be saying to yourself, where's Dan? Well, uh, some things have come up. Dan is not with us today. He's fine. So don't worry about that. Don't start any rumors online that there's a problem with Dan because there's not, but he's not here. And we're going to work to get him back with us on another time so we can talk about hoteling and, and hot desking and all those things. But the show will go on. I'm going to talk about a number of things today. I hope that you'll stay with me. But most of all, I hope that you will choose to stay so that you can share your thoughts and ideas and questions as well. So what I really want to start with today is for you in uh, your comment area on whatever channel, whatever uh, channel that you're on, just tell us where you're from. Say hello. Say it. Tell us where you're from. If you can do that, that'd be great. I should be able to see most all the channels here. I hope you'll do that. And uh, I want you to throughout put in your questions <clears throat> about hybrid work or the future of work, what's going on uh, for you and your organization, what questions that you might have. And I will take those as we go. And I'll be happy to take those. In fact, it'll be a much more interesting conversation if we do. I have, on the other hand, prepared a few things for us to talk about. I'm going to talk about uh, really four things that I've been learning this week or that I've been talking about this week in regards to the future of work and hybrid work. And before I get into those, though, I want to tell you where where some of that came from. So I traveled to my first in-person conference this week. I was in Salt Lake City at the ATD, Association for Talent Development Conference. ICE, they call it, International Conference and Exposition, I think it stands for. Uh, that's where I was with some members of our team over the last several days. And uh, Wayne Termel and I, who you may have seen with me here before, um, co-author with me of a couple of books, and I spoke on Wednesday. And we asked we asked questions both at our exhibit uh, of exhibitors to excuse me at our exhibit of folks who came by, as well as from the people that were in our session, both live, face to face, and virtual, about their current scenario. What is hybrid going to look like for them? Um, what we heard overall is a lot of organizations, uh, you know, we're planning to go back. We've got a lot of clients in the same boat that we're planning to go back maybe after Labor Day if they hadn't already. And now they're, they're pushing on the pumping on the brakes and going to wait longer. So if you want to tell us in the, in the comments for yourself, what is your scenario in your organization? Are you back in the office? Um, do you have a date? If you have a date to, 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 for that to be happening, when that will be, we'd love to know that. But we heard a variety of answers, but we heard from a lot of people that if they were planning on Labor Day, it's going to be later now. It's one of the things we learned this week. It's what we've been hearing from clients anyway, but I thought that might be useful to you as we talk with people from around North America. And the other thing that, uh, that we heard from, especially including the virtual folks with us on Wednesday, is that um, about 50% of them said that our version of hybrid is going to be in the office some days each week scheduled. In other words, people will know which days they're going to be in and which days they won't be. So I'm going to talk about hybrid specifically uh, here in a couple minutes in a couple of different ways. Uh, but I think it's really interesting to note and to think about that very point is when we say hybrid work or a hybrid workplace, it's going to be different for different people. Exactly what it's going to look like is going to be different for different people. So again, if you're just joining us, glad that you're here. Dan Blayton is not with us here, unfortunately. Some things have come up. We're hoping to get him back with us, but we're going to talk about your questions about the future of work or the future of hybrid work. And I'm going to share with you four big things that I'm learning and, and helping people with right now uh, to be very timely here as we talk on the 3rd of September of 2021. So Again, put in your comments, put in your questions. Let me know where you're at. Let me know what your situation is in terms of your return to work. I would love to see and hear those things. Um, and so Christine says, no firm. I'm going to just put up here so you can all see it. No firm to date to return, push to next year. Um, yeah, so if there are people that had, you know, there have been people, some people in the office for a very long time, right? Maybe they could not leave for whatever reason. And uh, so Christine, um, I would say that we're hearing um, some of that 
about the being pushed, right? So we've got clients pushing to October, pushing to November, pushing to January, pushing to an unknown date, pushing to an unknown date next year is what you're hearing uh, in your organization. So wherever you are in that range, if you haven't come back yet, you're not alone. I'll just say, say it that way. So I, I said I would talk about some, and someone else just said same here uh, for them. So let me, and again, put in your questions, put in your thoughts. Uh, if you have them, I'll see them. I'll, I'll post them up here uh, if they fit and uh, we'll talk about them. So feel free to do that as I go along. I do have these four points that I want to share with you. And uh, oh, Jessica says, hi, Jessica, that about uh, 25% of people are back full time set to return uh, for the end of September hybrid to return in October. So they've got a plan, right? And uh, so again, I'm not here today to say whose plan is the right plan. I'm here to say, what are we learning about all of it, regardless of what people's plans are? And that's what I want to spend a little bit of time on when I'm not answering your questions. So uh, let me just start with this. And if you get my LinkedIn newsletter, I wrote about this this week. And as is often the case, I learn as much about it after I, as I write about it and after I write about it as I had before I actually wrote um, oh, so now we have people saying, oh, good morning to you, Thea. Glad to see, see you. Happy Friday to you. Uh, Michelle says, tentative January 2022, three days in the office, two days remote. So, Michelle, I'm curious, uh, is every on the days in, is it everybody or will people have different days? Um, because, again, even when we say that, there's still questions about what that's actually going to mean. So if you want to share that, Michelle, that would be awesome for us. Lou is saying he's in New Jersey, and he says everybody's coming back October the 4th with a hybrid schedule. And I really hope for your sake and everybody's sake that that date holds, Lou, because if those dates get pushed again, that means things aren't going as well for us collectively as maybe we'd like to hope. And Christine says she's in Spokane, Washington, that she's not at the end of the earth. Uh, but we can see it from there. You can actually see it from Coeur d'Alene and you can see it from lots of places. And, and Spokane is a wonderful place to be, Christine. I'll just say that, I'll just say that having been there um, in the wonderful Palouse of Western, or excuse me, of Eastern Washington. So uh, I wrote about this this week. Why are we going hybrid? And as I said, and if you don't get my LinkedIn newsletter, and you're on, here's both of you, especially here on LinkedIn, um, uh, we'll try to get the link in here or you can go there uh, and, and get that. It's called Remarkable Results. But I talked about this in the in the weekly newsletter. And as I started to say a second ago, I often learn as much about what I want to write as I'm writing it or after I wrote, wrote it, uh, after I write it in terms of the feedback that I get or my continued thoughts. And so I thought I'd expand on that a little bit more. So if you missed it, one more thing before I do that. Becky says, we're in Reno. We're back at 25%, 100% of people back in 2022. That's in, that's interesting, right? Thea says we're transitioning back as well uh, as we can to stabilize. 150 are remote, 50 on site. So three quarters out, one quarter in, right? Um, sorting out the schedule, right? And we got lots of people saying, uh, oh, Michelle comes back and says, uh, we don't know yet, about three days in, two days out, um, maybe one day for everyone in the office. I think there's all sorts of things, probably for another day for us to talk about. In fact, I'll tell you when I am going to talk about that idea of what are we going to do when we're here, there, when we're not there. I'll tell you a little bit what I'm going to say more about that. Catherine says, Catherine's also in, in Spokane. So we get, we're, we're, we're live and popular in Spokane today, everybody. Um, September 13th, pretty soon. That's awesome. Um, Two days a week, minimum three days if you want to keep your cubicle. Otherwise, it's hoteling. So you know what that tells me? Awful lot of people are going to come in three, which leads to another thing. And that is that, uh, and I heard this this week as well a good bit, is that there's going to be unspoken pressure to come in more. Now, we wrote about in the Long Distance Teammate about the idea of ethical visibility, longdistanceteammate.com. We wrote about the idea of ethical visibility, meaning that you can be visible when you're at a distance and you can do that in an ethical way, right? Um, but there are going to be people that are going to feel like, yeah, we're going to, it's going to be left up to us, but I'm going to feel like I need to be there. And I'm going to tell you, if you're a leader 
and you don't want people to have that unspoken pressure, you're going to have to work really hard to make sure that they're not, um, people aren't feeling that way. Uh, for sure. For sure. Okay. I'm going to let, let all this sit there for a little bit and go back to what I was starting to talk about and, and answer this question. So here's the thing. Lots and lots of people going hybrid, right? And once it becomes the in thing, I think a lot of times we start going that way. I, I've talked with, and once it becomes a trend, people start asking the question, why are we going hybrid? And I think it's important to think about that. I think it's important to think about that for our organizations and for ourselves. And, and I've come to this conclusion in my observations, working with leaders and organizations around the world for the last 18 months. And that is that we're going hybrid for one of two reasons. And one, and they may not be spoken, and you may not have even thought about them. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's useful for me to mention this to you right now. The first one I would say is this, that we are going hybrid because we feel like we're being forced to. Like if we don't go hybrid, then we're going to lose all of our employees. And we don't want the turnover tsunami. We don't want the great resignation. We feel like our employees are holding us hostage, that we've got to appease our employees. If we don't go hybrid with them at least part of the time, bad things will happen to our company. We can't afford to do that. We don't want necessarily want to, but we feel like we got to. Now, there's very few people who are going to say that out loud. They're not going to say it in a, <laughs> going to say it in a cocktail party. But I can tell you that's where some leaders are. That's where some organizations are. Now, there's another reason why people are going hybrid. And so there's the, we feel like we're forced. We feel like we've got to. And the other reason we're going hybrid is we're choosing it. Organizations say, that's what we need to do. That's what we want to do. That's the choice we're making. We're going to make the best of the situation. This might not have been what we thought we wanted to do, but now we feel like it's the right thing for us to do. Now, I'm not going to judge you about which of those two choices, reasons for making the choice. But I am going to say that if you're make, you have made the choice or are making the choice because you feel forced, it's going to show up in the organization. It's going to show up not because you said it, but because people are going to feel it. It's going to show up in the culture. It's going to show up in the way you interact. It's going to show up in how you treat the people that are in versus the people that don't come in. It's going to show up in ways you don't even realize. And so, and, and even if you sort of think that's kind of maybe why our organization did it, even if that if that's where you physically were and it was your decision, I'm going to encourage you to make a new decision now. Yeah, you've made that decision. Now I want you to get, a, as my dad used to say, an attitude adjustment. And I want you to think about how I can make this a choice moving forward and how we can get the best from it as a result. I believe that this is a hugely important point that no one's thinking about. Everyone's talking, including me, talking about what is your hybrid going to be? Are you going to go hybrid? What's it going to look like? When are you going to do it? How are you going to do it? I think we have to, have to ask ourselves that why question. And I, I may require some soul searching. You may not have thought about it until I said it that way. But I would say to you that it's important for you to consider. I need to stop. I see a bunch of comments coming in. So I need to zoom back up here and pick up on some of these, right? Um, yeah, we got people still saying when they're coming back. Don't know when they're coming back. Um and there are people now talking about hoteling, and I'm sure that's why some of you were here, because that's what we promised. But we couldn't really found when we found this out, it was hard for us to change the event. So we hope that when you we do get Dan with us, that you'll come back and join us then. Um, Michelle says making it a positive choice is a better approach, even if you came into it feeling like we had to appease our folks. But if we don't do it, we're going to have trouble. Even if that's where you started, it's not too late to change it. It's not too late to change it and think about the battle, the better things that can come as a result of this. I'm going to get at uh, perspective for you on that in just a second, right? Michelle says she likes being home with her new beagle. Um, and we don't have pictures of that, uh, of the dog. But, um, you know, there's, there's a bunch of stuff I've read recently about people being worried about how their new puppies or cats and or pets are going to be when they're no longer having their owners home with them because they've been used to them, right? Um, someone is giving me a Bravo, so I better put it up here. Um, 
thank you for saying important to walk walk the talk. We were tempted to reopen on a rotating schedule and saw through our words we had high turnover, which is why we were slow to open. Make sure our actions and mindset match. There's the bravo, the last line there. we got to make sure our actions and our mindsets match. My comment about the why is all about the mindset, right? All about this big question. It's all about what mindset are we bringing to all this? Listen, anything that you do because you feel like you have to or you need to or you're forced to doesn't usually go so well, does it? And I'm suggesting even if that's why you got here, time to change your mindset about it. I'm going to give you an idea about that in just a second. I even have props. So I'll get to that in just a second. Oh, there you go. We're going to get a picture of the beagle. Um, she's going to put a picture in her profile. So Michelle, when you do that, let me know. We'll put it up there so everyone can see right there. You can see that little picture of that of that beagle. Okay. Um, and, and by the way, I, I just want to, I'm going to go, I'll come back to you, Jessica, in just a second. I want to just say something. You may be saying, well, Kevin, I didn't come here to hear about Michelle's beagle. But if we're going to work in a hybrid workplace and all of us right now are remote from each other, we have to find ways to create connectedness, relatedness, and relationship. And uh, as I wrote and, and did a video about several months ago, I, I believe that the new meeting metric ought to be laughs per meeting. Like if we're not having any fun at all, then we're missing it because some we had some fun. We were all together, right? But if we're feeling like we're not getting any of that anymore, then we have to work to find it. So I'm going to be happy to show Michelle's beagle when she uh, changes her profile. And everyone on LinkedIn is going to wonder why Michelle's beagle is in her profile. Um, Jessica says, a blend of collaboration and independent work is best for me in my role. I'm looking forward to finding the best blend for me and my family. I believe this is where leaders ought to be. Here's the reality. The reality is we have a responsibility to get great work accomplished. We as leaders, whether it's as a frontline supervisor or as a senior leader in an organization, we're responsible for outputs, getting results. That has to happen. People that are feeling like, well, we're giving up on results or outputs because we're going hybrid are missing the point because we don't do that work ourselves. We do it with and through other people. And so leadership is about outcomes or outputs and others. And we have to find the balance between those two things. That's the blend. Right. Okay. I see it, Michelle. I'll come back to it in a few minutes. I haven't forgotten. I haven't, I've noticed it. Okay. That blend is so very important. Finding the best blend for me and my family, for us as individuals and for the organizations. That's super important. Right. Lou is saying something I've heard a hundred times. And it's worth saying again for years, management thought we couldn't be trusted to do our job with the work from home option. Many of us have been doing for 18 months. That fear has been put to rest in our business environment. Hopefully, and yet many organizations are saying, well, I can't wait to bring everybody back so we can get collaboration back. I'm going to get, let me just go there right now. That wasn't the next point I was going to make, but let me make that point next, right? Let me just say this. Collaboration isn't about whiteboards. I'm Like you, I like, a, I mean, I like a good whiteboard. I don't even mind smelling the markers. Uh, I have a whiteboard right over here on the wall. And a lot of people, I've heard it from Hundreds of leaders in the last two years. Well, we just can't, you know, it's just not the same. You can't collaborate when you're apart. You know, you know, there's not the same as being on a whiteboard. Let me tell you what I've learned about whiteboard, whiteboards. I've walked into hundreds of offices and conference rooms in my life with, with, with whiteboards. About half of them have something on it that says save or has to, nothing's, it looks like it's not been written on in forever. So we can say, man, I missed the whiteboard and the spontaneity that comes with that. And I would agree there's nothing quite like it. It's fine to feel that way. But did you know that there are whiteboard tools in pretty much any of the tools, that, technology tools that you're using? And did you know that in some ways they're better to use than this? It's just that this is what we remember, right? We could erase like this, but we can let everyone have their, literally have their own pen at the same time on the virtual whiteboard. My comment here really, though, isn't about whiteboards. Uh, I mean, we could have a whole technology conversation, how to use your whiteboard, how to use your virtual whiteboard better and all that stuff. But there are a lot of people saying, well, we just can't collaborate because we're, we're hybrid or we're virtual or we're at a distance. To which I would say, with love, poppycock. Uh, this week, in the last in the last nine days, I've seen three members of my team 
that I hadn't seen, two of them that I hadn't seen since May of 2019, and one that I hadn't seen in person, that I hadn't seen in person since January of 2020. Key members of my team. This week I saw someone that I recently hired that I'd never met until this week. We have had more collaboration, more new product development, more growth, and the best year from a revenue perspective in our company's history last year, and even better this year, without necessarily seeing each other. Collaboration is not about whiteboards. It doesn't require that we have to be in the same place. It just doesn't. Now, again, I like these tools as much as anybody, but don't use that as an excuse. And don't use that to say, well, we got to bring you back so that we can have collaboration because it's just not true. Might we have to do something different? Might we have to learn something? Is there still a place for us to be together? I'm not saying we shouldn't be together. I'm just saying we don't have to be all the time. Did I love getting to see those members of my team for the first time in all that time? 100%. It doesn't have to be either or. It really shouldn't be either or. Okay, before I go to my next point, you're all dying to see the puppy. So let me go get to the puppy here. Uh, Michelle's puppy is now her profile picture. And you can sort of, if you look down there real close, you can see Michelle's beagle right there. And now, you know, the next question everyone's going is asking is what's the dog's name? So Michelle, now you got to tell us what the dog's name is. Um, so while Michelle's doing that and you're getting ready to share with me whatever questions you have, talk about whatever questions you have or any, any responses to what I've been saying, I'd love to have those. But let me share with you another one of the lessons that I've learned. And it relates to popcorn. Now, I happen, uh, uh, so lessons from hybrid popcorn. Trust me, this popcorn came from hybrid popcorn seed. Let me let me tell you a little bit why, about why I know that. Because I happen to to be a board member of the world's largest popcorn genetics company. And what does that mean? What that means is that we create new hybrid varieties and sell those as seed. That seed is then planted to grow the popcorn that you might eat. And more of our seed is planted around the world than anybody else's. And so it's very likely that popcorn that you've eaten wherever you live has was came from our work from the organization that I'm part of. So let me tell you a little bit about, so we're all using this word hybrid as it relates to work now, right? So let me tell you a little bit about what that really means in the world of plant breeding, okay? Well, if you look it up in the dictionary, they'll use hybrid to say two different species come together and they'll do things like, you know, they'll create this broccoli cauliflower mixture. Well, that's a hybrid, right? Or what is it? Uh, a, uh, a donkey and a horse makes a mule, right? That's a hybrid. Well, let me tell you how this works in the world of plant breeding. The world of, world of plant breeding, there are different varieties of any, any plant, right? We have different varieties of popcorn. And so each variety has some strengths, right? And so what they do is they breed, they cross breed them, uh, cross pollination. They do this very carefully, but they cross breed them with the intention of creating a new variety that is better than the other two, better than the parents, right? And here's what happens. We do this crossing to try these new hybrids. Some of them are better. Some of them are not. All of them are different. So we have two that we bring together, and they will be different for sure. They won't necessarily be better. And we have lots of choices, lots of tries. And we keep trying this multiple times a year, doing these crosses to create a new different thing that's better than either of the parents. I believe that, you know, I've been actually using the word hybrid team for years and uh, I'm certainly not going to take credit for that's why people are using it. But I am going to say I believe it's the right word because ultimately that's what we should be trying to create is something new that's better than either all remote or all in person. But that's actually it will be different, but that will be better. And your version of it doesn't have to be the same as my version because your better might be different than our better. Right. So I don't that's why we in the popcorn business don't just have one hybrid that we sell because different hybrids do better in different climates, different soil types, different growing seasons, etc. 
Same for your organization. Your mileage may vary. That's okay, right? Our goal should be trying to create something new that's better than the other options. Once we've made the decision to do something that looks like hybrid. And our goal here in our organization and help, whether it's on this live or all the work that we do, is to help speed the process of you finding that new thing that's better than others so that you don't have to do it all by trial and error. Okay. All right. So now here we go. Baz's name. I moved him to a post and put her photo back. So if you want, there's a link. If you're on LinkedIn, you can go right there and you can learn all about Baz the Beagle. Just say it. Michelle, you did not know that your Beagle was going to get famous today, did you? You did not know that. And and I guess uh, maybe you didn't want that to happen, but you've played along. So let's, so thank you for doing that. Um, uh, Lou made an interesting point back to my last point. So uh, that's all I want to say right now about this, this connection to the word hybrid and plant breeding and all that stuff. And Lou says learning new ways and expanding on the old ways need not be explored, right? Yeah. Uh, figuring out the new best normal is the key, right? Michelle says the dog should be famous. Well, there you go. Well, I'm going to do my part to help with that in some small part. Um, back to the earlier point that I made about collaboration. Lou says a collaboration is what your leadership is comfortable with prior to all of this. So I do think that some organizations, unfortunately, are using that as the excuse to say we got to bring people back. And we've got organizations where publicly the organization is saying, I won't mention any names here, but they're clients of ours. Um, Publicly, they're saying and saying to the organization and creating policies that say we're going to have hybrid and there's going to be options and here's how it's going to work. And yet senior executives are saying, well, except all my direct reports need to be in for every meeting. And so the long term repercussions of that duality, um, you know, it's not hard to figure out what's going to happen there. It's going to be a challenge. It's going to be hard. And uh, so so there's that. So I said I would give you four ideas. And so far, I've talked to you a little bit about, I've talked about the why question. I've talked about some of the myths about the need to collaborate at having to be together to collaborate. Talked a little bit about my popcorn excursion uh, with you. And the last one I want to talk to you about a little bit more today is some things that we're learning in real time with our team. So I've had a hybrid team for a decade and our team is continuing to grow. And recently, August the 11th, to be specific, we added two new members to our team. And so while we've certainly onboarded people before in a hybrid setting, um, we're doing it again and in real time, trying to not only apply what we know works, but what we've been telling others to do and to try. And so I thought I'd just share a couple of things with you about that. One is I think there are opportunities here is this going to be, is this challenging? Yes. Right. Is, is onboarding important? 100%. But are there some opportunities here? I believe that there are. And one of them is that oftentimes when people, if, if you have people in different offices, let's say, but you've got a bunch of people that are together, that you end up picking a mentor or a person for that person, for the new person to shadow that is down the hall or in the next cubicle, et cetera. Okay. Why not make, why not pick a different person to do that? Why not have that be someone who's not always there? Or why not potentially have two people to mentor them or two people that they can shadow? Certainly something worth thinking about, right? Um, the other thing that, I, and I've been preaching this to organizations for a long time. I believe it's true. I actually believe it should be done. I would, I'll do it this, say it this way. What I'm about to tell, encourage you to do if you are onboard, onboarding people in a hybrid team or a remote team, uh, we do, have done, are doing right now. And I would actually say that even if I, excuse me, led a team where everyone was together, I would do it anyway. I think it's that important. And here it is. Uh, when my two, our new, two new people joined us on the 11th of August, one of my very first instructions to them was in the next two weeks, I'd like you to have a conversation with every other member of the team. And there are 15 of us total to give you context. Um, 
And I want you to have a 30 minute conversation, preferably on webcam, but if not that on the phone with the intent of getting to know that other person. Now you might need to talk to some of those people about their work. And so you might schedule a one hour meeting because you need to talk about the work interactions and that's all fine. But I want 30 minutes for you to get to know them and them to get to know you. Well, why do I do that? Well, I, I think even if we're in person, if we're in, all in person face to face, it's more likely that some of that will happen. I don't think there's any guarantee it happens then, but I think it's more likely to happen then. That's why I would probably do this even if everyone was in the same building. I'd say have coffee with everyone in the next two weeks. But why do I do this? Why is this so important? Well, I, I do this because I really want them to build relationships with their teammates because it's an important part of, of their work experience. And it's an important part of how we do work. It's an important part of what our company culture is, which is that we are one team. And so I believe that it sets people up to succeed, all people, not just the new people. Uh, I also believe that it is just the right thing to do on a both productivity and uh, interpersonal basis. And lastly, if I really want people to have relationships, I've got to model it. I've got to show people that it's important and I show it's important by putting that time in, investing that time. So think about it. 15 people, that means each of those two people having 14 meetings. That means seven hours of their time, seven hours of other people's time with each people, each person. So that's 14, 28 hours, half of a person over three quarters of a person week invested in getting to know other people on the team. If I tell people that relationships are important, it's one thing. If we act on it in that way and a hundred others, it sends a much different message, does it not? And I hope that that's useful. I'm going to get some comments and go back to those now. Um, someone says, uh, we do that. I schedule as part of new employees onboarding. The team loves it. We require the camera. Yep, I'm a big believer in the webcam. And in per perfect world, that's where the webcams will be on as well. For sure. Um, let's see. Oh, there's a question. I'll come back to that. Sorry, Catherine. I'll get back to that in one second. Um, someone says managers have to learn a new way to manage and a new way to respond and react in a hybrid environment. For sure. Right. Michelle says establishes a feeling of family within the team or department. That's true. And I would tell you this, if you're, if you're organizing, depending on this, this all depends on your organization, right? Not everyone reports directly to me, but we see ourselves as one team of 15 let's say you're a department in a bigger organization, then you might want to think about not just getting that nuclear team, if you will, to have those relationships. But one of the things that's really been hurt in the last 18 months is even if teams that have kept this together, their relationships and their interactions with this together, it's that next round, it's that next periphery, it's the people in the other departments. Maybe there are some specific people in other departments that as a part of this onboarding, you want to do that same thing with them in that next circle of folks. And maybe for your whole team, that next circle is where you need to be thinking about reinvesting as a group. Uh, that's worth thinking about. Lou says that work from home is now becoming work from anywhere. And I think that's exactly right. And one of those two team, team members, everybody right here, Eric Dolson says it's a crucial element. He's the, He's been living through it. So you can ask him questions right here if you want about whether it's working or not, or maybe you don't want to ask here since his boss is here. Um, but Catherine asked a question, can you speak about how to express this to staff in terms of work-life balance, it does not mean just seem like lip service. Well, uh, first of all, those two people had those conversations with me and or having those conversations with me too. So hopefully it's not just lip service if I'm living it as well, right? For sure, 100%. So I, I would say this, what we say doesn't really matter all that much. Because people aren't watching our lips. They're watching our feet and our fingers in a virtual world. What are we actually doing? Where are we spending our time? Are we actually available for people? And even if I tell Eric and Kat to have those conversations with everybody else on the team, even if I do that, then if in every meeting it's just let's talk about the work and nothing else ever, then there's a disconnection there too, right? So the, while I believe it's a valuable technique and approach, if it's only a tactic, it doesn't really solve what we want 
either. So Catherine, I hope that that helps a little bit, right? Um, <laughs> yes, Eric has a famous dog as well. Michelle says, uh, it's like Keith Ferrazzi's never eat alone. My copy's over there. Uh, I've had Keith on uh, my podcast. He was live with us um, uh, on our virtual leader con last year. Uh, I'll mention virtual leader con in a second. I try to eat lunch with a different person, new person every day. I found if someone didn't know very well, I asked to sit with them in the lunchroom. And of course we can't do that now. We can still reach out to people. And even if you're not going to actually eat with them on your webcam, you can still find ways to interact with others. And uh, in a world that was, in a world that was uh, creating loneliness and isolation before COVID, doing that now is more important than ever for us and for the other person. It's a it's a source of it's a source of energy for us, of course, but it's a source of service to others to do that as well. I think that's super super important, and uh, I appreciate that comment a whole lot. So I just mentioned this thing called Virtual LeaderCon. So I'm gonna. Uh, I'm not going to, I don't have it in here. Oh yeah, I can do it this way. Uh, if you give me just a second, I'll, I'll tell you about it and then I'll type it in. Oh, I have it right here. There it is. Virtualleadercon.com, uh, September the 20th, two weeks from Monday uh, for five straight days. I'll be live in this space in a different platform, totally different platform inside of virtualleadercon.com. 40 leadership experts with me, people that you've definitely heard of, I promise, some that you haven't, but will be glad to meet. All of it 100% free. To watch it live, um, you want to go sign up for that virtualleadercon.com and you can, yeah, it's all for free. Now, you can only watch it live for free if you want to upgrade to have access to what you miss or to have archives to what you were there for, but you want to be involved in later. It's all available to you in, with uh, at a small investment there. But when you come and join us live, you get the chance to have this community of learners around you, get the chance to learn with those other folks, get the chance to be in the conversation that I'll be leading with all those folks and with the rest of you. Um, in many ways, like this has been where we start to get to know each other and chat a bit, but in a platform that's different than any of the ones you're in now that I think you'll find will be a very powerful chance for learning to happen. Uh, the other thing I want to mention before we go today uh, is if this has been useful. And as I said, we promised Dan Bladen he wasn't able to join us today. I'm hoping to get him back. And as soon as that happens, we'll schedule one of these. If it's not on a Friday, we'll schedule it on another day because we really want to get him to come and join us to talk about hoteling and hot desking. So if you came for that and, and stayed anyway, I'm glad because hopefully you got something of value. You could have chosen to leave. And so I'm hoping that you got value from it. The other thing I want to tell you about before we go is on September the 30th, uh, we're going to do a live cast. It will also be on a different platform than wherever you're at now. But, but if you go to remote remoteleadershipinstitute.com slash livecast. You can sign up for that livecast, which will be led by me. I will be joined by Wayne Tremell, my co-author on these two books. We'll have some case studies with some other folks, some other folks that have been living through and making some of this future of work stuff work. And we're going to have a great deal of fun. You'll have a chance to ask your questions and get your thoughts, uh, share your thoughts with Wayne and I and the rest of the folks that join us. This is 100% free, remoteleadershipinstitute.com slash livecast. You can sign up for it today. And we're going to have more details on exactly what's going to be happening here in the next few days. But it doesn't cost you anything to sign up. Get it on your calendar. September the 30th, starting at 1.30 Eastern, maybe 2 o'clock Eastern, but certainly one in the afternoon Eastern time on September the 30th, you're going to want to join us uh, for this Future of Work live cast. Hope you'll do that. I want to thank you for being with us. Sorry again that we didn't have Dan Bladen with us today. Hope we'll have him with us soon. I hope that you have a wonderful day and a fantastic weekend. And if you joined us later and not with us live, uh, I hope that you found this valuable. And uh, either way, whether you're live or later, we'll be back here next Friday at the same time, noon Eastern time live. And if you miss it then or you're sleeping then, you can join us later as well. Hope you'll come back then. We'll be announcing our guest. Maybe it'll be Dan. We'll be announcing our guest soon for next week. And uh, one way or another, I look forward to seeing you then. And I look forward to seeing you on our live cast. I'll leave that up there for one more second. And uh, people are saying thank you. Catherine, you are welcome. And others as well. Thanks, everybody, for being here. We will talk to you all soon. Have a remarkable weekend, everybody.